you simply can't give any ground. You can't round the corners, whether that's in your faith life or in your life doing your best to serve uh, uh, the country. You can compromise on lots of little things, but on the central thesis of protecting human life and defending American value sets, recognizing the Judeo-Christian heritage of our country, knowing your partners and friends around the world like the nation of Israel. If you, if you get those wrong, you risk losing the Republican. And I was never prepared to give an inch on those things that really mattered most. And you describe General Secretary Xi Jinping as the most dangerous man in the world. You've met him. You've studied him closely. You were working four years to try to counter communist China's malign activities. What do we need to know about him that you know? Well, Joel, I'd, I'd start with three ideas. First, he has already led the Chinese nation down a path that it has been decades since a Chinese leader has done. So it's not the Chinese people. It is Xi Jinping and the leadership around him. And now he is essentially leader for life inside of China. That is a, another bad sign. Uh, second, he has made right. clear his intentions. He, he, he doesn't hide this. It's not, it's not a secret. He wants to, quote, reunify, end of quote, Taiwan. He wants to gain power not only in Asia, but throughout the world. He has hegemonic objectives. The last thing to know about him is he's incredibly capable. He understands that this war has been fought economically for 40 years. He understands that the United States of America for those very 40 years has done almost nothing to push back against it. And so they've had free reign, destroying tens of millions of American jobs, taking them to China, billions and billions of dollars of American intellectual property, and that from other Western nations as well. He, is, he needs to see an America that is prepared to push back and confront. When we do, Joel, um, we can be successful. Last thought, Xi Jinping knows that the weakness of America is the inverse of its very strength. And he is working inside of our open society to propagandize and to dominate the way that America thinks about itself. His vision, his vision about, about uh, American decline. He talks about American decline all the time. He is not only observing it, he is pushing it, trying to further it through Chinese propaganda in our schools and universities here in the United States, in our research laboratories. Uh, they're buying American assets all across the country. Their diplomats are conducting propaganda and espionage all across our country. This is an alarming effort that Xi Jinping is undertaking, not, not in Asia and not in the Pacific, but in states and local governments all across America. So let me ask you the same question I asked about Iran. Is there the how how close are we to uh, Beijing deciding it's time to go get Taiwan and could that happen in the next two years before there's a potential uh, change in administration? Well, Joel, there's some risk of that. Uh, the United States Department of Defense has said in the next four or five years that could could well happen. Much of this, however, Joel, just depends. If, if say, how long is it going to take? And my answer is always, well, it depends on the U.S. response. So the U.S. could today be providing Taiwan with the tools it needs to defend itself. Much as we're now scrambling to try and help the people of Ukraine, we should be today, not after the first bullet has flown, not after the invasion has right. begun, not after the blockade has been established, we should be helping them. Second, uh, just as in Ukraine, we need the Europeans to lead. We need countries in the region to lead on this fight against the Chinese Communist Party as well. I think Australia, Japan, Singapore, Vietnam, uh, the list goes on. They understand the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. They don't always feel free to talk about it because of the threat and the fact that China will retaliate. Right. But we're going to need those partners, those nations alongside of us. And when we do that, Joel, I'm confident we can prevail. But if we don't do that, then uh, China having control of Taiwan, China moving to control all of the Pacific, those are things we're too likely to see. And we just simply can't let that happen. You were just in Taiwan just a few months ago, I believe it was, and... What were you hearing from them? And what would you say President Biden is doing right at the moment about China? And what is he doing wrong? So I give the administration credit, Secretary Blinken and his team, uh, Director Burns at CIA and his team, they, they understand the problem well. So they have now uh, uh, adopted the same understanding of China that we had. What they have not done as aggressively is begin to shape economic policy, our military policy, preparing for uh, our diplomatic and economic engagements in the region. And, and they have worked hard to build out these partnerships. I applaud them for that with something called the Quad, which are the, the Indians and uh, two other partners in the United States and Australians and two other partners. We have Australia, to get those things right, Joel. Yeah. If we get those right, if we get those right, I'm confident that we will prevail. China is not, they're not 10 feet tall. They've got problems. 
We just need to make the Chinese people be successful and Xi Jinping fail. This is a question that everybody I know who knew that you, I was going to interview insisted that I ask you. Uh, based on everything that you've seen, do you believe that the communist Chinese regime unleashed the COVID-19 virus as a bioweapon? Uh, it's killed more than six and a half million people already worldwide, more than a million Americans. It's inflicted tremendous damage to the American and global economies. But it, was, this, it, was this an attack? Was this a mistake? What did it, you, you know better than almost anybody in the world as much <laughs> as it can be known. What can you tell people? Joel, here's my assessment. Uh, in the end of 2019, the Chinese had a virus escape from their lab in Wuhan, China. When that virus escaped, they knew it. They did nothing. When it began to blow up, that is, it's a relatively contagious, relatively lethal virus, they did exactly the wrong thing. They covered it up. Uh, they disappeared people who knew. They wouldn't let Western medical professionals, scientific professionals, vi virology professionals come in. And then they made an incredibly fateful decision. And they did so intentionally. They had people they knew to be ill get on airplanes and travel across the world. First to Milan in the thousands and thousands and then to other places as well. This is a knowing transmission of a, of a lethal virus that is contagious. The result is you're exactly what you described. Billions of dollars worth of lost wealth and millions of people that have died. That was a horrific decision. And frankly, it reflects Xi Jinping's complete and total disregard for human dignity. It's terrifying. And, I, you know, when you th read Bob Woodward's uh, recent book, I know we don't usually like to do that, but sometimes you have to. Uh, he acts like the Trump did nothing uh, when he moves, uh, when the, the Trump administration, with your uh, 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 guidance and advice, we've got to shut down this corridor uh, of, uh, of travel between China and the United States. That was an incredibly early decision. It was. And uh, President Trump made a good decision. Uh, maybe in hindsight, uh, sooner would have been better, but make no mistake about it. We were the first country to actually do that. We could see what was happening and we knew the source. At that point, it became very, very hard. We were working, I was working with the head of the CDC here in the United States. We were trying to get the Chinese Communist Party to permit us to help them. And instead, we had everyone working against us, not only Xi Jinping, uh, but much of the world, including at that point, the World Health Organization that was a complete failure at this yeah. time of pandemic. The way I read the situation in Ukraine right now is that Putin is losing and he didn't expect to be losing this badly. This suggests to me that he's that he's feeling humiliated and humiliation doesn't seem like a word in his uh, vocabulary. Uh, what's the what's the risk that he goes crazy and decides to use tactical nuclear weapons, not because it will necessarily win, but because it will freak everybody out? Joel, we've seen him talk about this. We've seen him bluster about this. It is a real possibility. My, I can't I can't assess the probability. I can only say this. Every day that this conflict goes on, every day that this continues is another day that he might do something. I think you described it as really stupid, right? Something even even crazier, uh, whether that's a, a tactical nuclear weapon or shutting off energy supplies in places that we haven't thought about or attacking outside of Ukraine. You can imagine him taking lots of actions that make this conflict even worse than it is today. It's why my, my discipline, so I applaud the Biden administration for providing the Ukrainians with the systems we have. I sadly wish we had done this months and months and months ago. We knew they were going yeah. to invade, that the Russians were going to invade Ukraine in September yeah. a year ago. And we did nothing until they actually came across the line. All right, a few more questions in the few minutes we have here. Uh, when I interviewed you in on the September 11th weekend in 2021 at the Museum of the Bible event that we did together, I asked you, all right, we covered a lot of these type of threats, but I asked you, what else keeps you up at night, right? What are you worrying about that maybe we haven't covered? And one of the things you said that chilled me, and you do deal with it in the book, is ungoverned spaces, uh, particularly in Mexico, and the threat of terrorists coming through Mexico because the Mexican government has basically abdicated a lot of the responsibility up on that border with our with our southern border. So talk to me about it because I, I I'm not sure if you know this because you've been a little busy. That 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 comment that you made in that interview became the premise of my next political thriller. I'll, I'll send you a copy. Uh, uh, it comes out in May. The Libyan diversion. I literally thought, oh my god, that's horrifying. What? What if that, look, I got to play that out as, as a real threat. Talk to us about the threat of ungoverned spaces, particularly the, 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 the border crisis uh, with Mexico and the United States. Well, Joel, I look forward to reading how that all actually ends <laughs> in your book. Uh, 
the idea of ungoverned space is something that we've known for a long time. Uh, it was really in the Afghan-Pakistan border in Africa, where terrorists build their training schools, they gather and plot global attacks. It's always been 6,000 miles away from the United States. Israel hasn't been as lucky, right? They've had ungoverned spaces on their border. Now the United States is suffering from those ungoverned spaces, and the risk is the same. Uh, today, cartels operate freely from those spaces. They run massive billion-dollar business enterprises. The difference between a cartel guy and a jihadist, <laughs> Joel, when you lay it all out, not that much in terms of the kinds of objectives they had and the risk that they present. And I am very worried that now we have ungoverned spaces just a, a mile or two from the United States of America. And the risk of terror emanating from that place is very significant. It means that we're going to have to rethink the relationship with Mexico, how we deal with them how we not only protect the United States, but we want to help the Mexican people protect themselves. Never give an inch. What's, what's the core message of that book? Why is that? Why do you pick that title? Titles are big for authors. So uh, why that title? What, what does that mean to you? And what should our viewers walk away going, I get that guy in a way maybe I didn't before? Joel, the subtitle of Never Give an Inch is Fighting for the America I Love. And they're connected ideas. Uh, this is an amazing nation. I've had this incredible privilege. America's given me so much opportunity. And on the things that really matter, you simply can't give any ground. You can't round the corners, whether that's in your faith life or in your life doing your best to serve uh, the country. You can compromise on lots of little things, but on the central thesis of protecting human life and defending American value sets, recognizing the Judeo-Christian heritage of our country, knowing your partners and friends around the world like the nation of Israel. If you, if you get those wrong, you risk losing the Republican. And I was never prepared to give an inch on those things that really mattered most. That's great. I'm told we have about a minute and a half. So I can ask you one more question? Yes, sir. Of course. Okay. All right. Mohammed bin Salman, Mohammed bin Zayed, the Bahrainis, the Abraham Accords. This has changed everything in this region. Uh, so... What, what's the next step? Is MBS going to make peace with Israel? I've met with them, but you've met with them more. I think you said that you went to the Sa Saudi Arabia uh, more than any other country except the capital of, of the NATO uh, headquarters in Belgium. And also, what's the, what do you think is the business opportunities uh, that, are, uh, that are opening up between the United States, Israel, and these Arab countries? Well, Joe, we can see the effects for those nations that have already chosen to sign the Abraham Accords. I'm confident more countries will also. Um, the, the crown prince, the heir to the throne in Saudi Arabia is someone who wants to bring that nation forward. He wants them to be th to thrive economically. He wants people to have more capacity uh, to be freer. He is building in the right direction. To do that, you're going to have to uh, make peace with every one of your neighbors when they're prepared to make peace with you. And so I'm confident you will see not only other nations in the Gulf states, but you'll see other Muslim nations. Think about Asia, where the biggest Muslim nations in the world are come to understand that it is, it's both most decent and in their economic interest to join something that looks like the Abraham Accords. Make peace, make prosperity, build security relationships, build people to people and economic relationships. Good things will happen across the world. Well, I agree, but but right now, uh, I interviewed uh, John Hanna, former uh, National Security Advisor for uh, uh, <laughs> Vice President Dick Cheney. He said, what, what MBS told him was, I'm ready to normalize with Israel, but somebody's got to help me normalize with Biden. <laughs> That's, that's a clever line. And sadly, there's too much truth to that. We saw this, right? President Biden said that he, it was a pariah nation. He wanted to separate the United States from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That was a massive foreign policy mistake. The kingdom of Saudi Arabia is an important partner for the United States. I, I pray that it will soon be an important partner with the nation of Israel as well. You, you have to get that right. Uh, we, we can be critical uh, when other countries make human rights errors. We do that to our friends, our allies, to our adversaries. But when you have important relationships, economic relationships, as President Biden quickly learned when he had to go to the kingdom and essentially uh, make peace for a moment so that he could get some more oil so energy prices would be lower here at home. When, when you make mistakes right. like President right. Biden made there, you risk these important relationships. We do have to get that relationship right. Uh, we had it right during our, our administration. It strikes me that now Netanyahu becomes the potential marriage broker between Saudi Arabia and the <laughs> Biden administration. It, Mr. Secretary, thank you. Thank you for your service to the country. Thank you for this great book. I encourage everyone to read it. And thank you for your time today and your friendship. Appreciate it. Thank you, Joel. Bless you. Good luck with your next book. 
What a fascinating conversation with really one of the most interesting people that I've ever met in Washington or around the world. Mike Pompeo is smart. This guy has delivered. He's accomplished. Um, and, 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 I, and I think he's a guy to keep your eye on. I don't know if he's going to run in 2024. And I'm not in the business of endorsing uh, candidates or uh, blasting them or supporting them. I just think these are people that if you love Israel and you love America and you're interested in what's happening in this part of the world, as well as in China, North Korea, so forth, this is a guy you need to get to know better. And one of the things about Mike Pompeo is he's not that well known. This is his challenge if he does run for president, because as a CIA director, you're a clandestine person. You rarely talk to the media and your trips are mostly secret. And what you do is highly uh, classified, right? And even as a secretary of state, mostly you're traveling around the world. You're mostly not talking to the American people. So that's why most Americans don't know how smart and accomplished and interesting Mike Pompeo really is.